refractance of moisture, of dust. You can detect the temperature off the ground. You can even sort of get a sounding of the atmosphere off a satellite as well. Um, observations from the ground, of course, are important. So we've got weather stations everywhere, and they're reporting temperature and dew point and pressure and rainfall, and all that data gets fed into the model. Uh, it's very important to have an understanding of what the surface of the ground is actually like, so what the terrain is, um, whether there's crops there, whether there's buildings there, um, what season it is for those crops, because, of course, that can have a very significant impact on the weather, whether it's green or whether it's brown, um, what the moisture in the soil is. All of this is really important data to be fed in if you're going to get a good result, particularly for things like soaring, where we're so sensitive to, for example, moisture on the ground, um, whereas a lot of models might just disregard that information completely. Um, and uh, model initialization data. So for SkySight and for most weather models, we don't forecast for the whole world at once. We forecast just for a small regional area, which then makes us dependent on information of what is coming into the model area outside of the areas we're forecasting for. So us, as well as most other weather models, rely on driving global models, which give us that information about what the air mass coming into our weather model is. And um, uh, they also give us that very initial state of what the air is uh, just directly above us when we start the model in the morning. Um, another important characteristic is the modeling of various physical processes. So it's not possible to completely accurately model every possible physical conversion, like these chemical reactions are happening on atomic scales, and it's, there's just simply not powerful enough computers to actually break these down uh, in the way they actually happen, and they never will be. Um, we'd need a computer larger than the size of the Earth to be able to predict the weather perfectly for the Earth, and I don't think that's in anyone's budget coming up soon. Um, so we, we parameterize these. We come up with an approximation of how these various physical processes work, how nucleation happens, how water turns to ice and to vapor, um, how clouds form, um, how the water is absorbed into the soil and released from the soil, um, even the growth of plants, um, their oxygen and CO2 cycle. Uh, all of these need to be um, parameterized in order to have a good result. And some of these are very important, of course, for soaring, and some of them are not so important for soaring. So for climate scale weather models, for example, it's very important to actually model the growth and decay of plants on a seasonal basis. Um, but when we're forecasting for one day, um, we're happy to just start with what the plants were doing this morning, and we don't actually need to spend CPU time modeling whether they're growing or decaying or being harvested through that day. Um, we start with a fresh start the following day. Um, so choosing the right parameterizations for what you're trying to achieve is very important. Um, so we obviously try and select the right ones for soaring. And then resolution. So resolution is usually the one that people are most familiar with when they're trying to evaluate um, a weather model. Um, people, uh, I think they got this idea from RASP. Uh, RASP used to have like a 12 kilometer and a four kilometer model or something like that. I don't quite remember. Um, so resolution is typically better, um, but definitely not at the expense of those other characteristics we were talking about, you know, the accurate initial state and the good parameterizations. Um, you do get rapidly diminishing returns, at least for soaring scale purposes when you go below four kilometers, um, but that is very sensitive to topology. Uh, so areas like through the Australian Alps there where the terrain is more complex, you do still see considerable benefit from that higher detail. Uh, but areas in central Australia, it makes very little difference, really. Things do get very complex, those higher resolutions. Excuse me. Um, many of those parameterizations were written in the 90s or the early thousands, and they weren't done with consideration for some of the effects you start to see at those very high resolutions. Um, so it's, it's something we're very careful of is that we don't exceed the um, capacity of the parameterizations we're using by increasing the resolution too far. Um, most people talk about, when they talk about a model, they only refer to the horizontal resolutions. They say, oh, this model is three kilometers or five kilometers or 10 kilometers. Um, but at least for gliding, uh, the vertical resolution, so how many vertical layers there are in the atmosphere is actually much more important. So the vertical resolution is harder to quantify because we don't space it four kilometers apart vertically. That wouldn't give us a very accurate thermal picture. Um, so within SkySight, uh, this is off the top of my head, like we might have a layer at two meters, at 10 meters, at 50 meters, at 100 meters, at 300 meters, and going up like that as we model the atmosphere. So as you get higher and higher, they get further and further apart. But the number of those layers and how many there are within the region of the boundary layer, that's the area we're flying, the turbulent layer near the Earth, um, that's really critical for soaring weather. And I think we've focused on to try and have 
as high vertical resolution as possible, as well as high horizontal resolution. And then another thing to consider when you're evaluating the resolution of model is over what area is that achieved. Um, so it's important to have that high resolution over the largest area possible. Because if you're just forecasting a very high detail for a very local area, you're entirely at the whims of how accurate the model outside of your forecast area is. So within Australia, for example, uh, even within southeastern Victoria, there's very significant impact on the weather from the things that are happening up in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. Uh, one of the things I noticed was uh, I often have to go in and manually edit the amount of water in Lake Eyre because that's not captured by some of those driving global models. And if that information isn't correct, then when you have the big trough systems, that moisture isn't wicking all the way down into Victoria like it probably should. Um, so let's let's look at that resolution just a little bit further. So I don't know if people can talk if, or if all of your microphone's muted, but can anyone tell me what this is a picture of? Anyone's welcome to jump in. Or you can type in if you'd rather. No, no takers. All right, well. Oops. Let's try a little bit more detail. Yeah, no, Matthew, okay, it's uh, not here. enough detail. Yeah, um, so here we've got a little bit more detail and we can start to see there's something going on. So I should have explained the analogy better. So this might be analogous to say a 36 kilometer weather model. So we've got very coarse picture. It's a little bit hard to tell what's going on. If we bring that detail up to about 12 kilometers, we can start to see it's possibly a glider, um, maybe on an airfield. There's some kind of um, topology around and there's some kind of clouds in the sky, but it's very hard to resolve what's going on. Uh, if we bring that up six kilometers, we're really starting to get some detail now. We can see that this glider probably shouldn't be on the ground. Uh, we're not sure, is it an airfield? Is it a outlanding field? Um, and maybe we can start to tell what type of glider it is, sort of. Uh, when we get up to three kilometers, we're really starting to get a very good picture of what's going on. We can see this glider isn't supposed to be here. We can see it's an outlanding field somewhere. We can see there's beautiful cumulus. We can see there's nice trees here. Um, maybe we can even tell where this is. So this is somewhere in the Dolomites that I outlanded a couple of years ago. Um, and then if we bring the detail all the way up to one kilometer, then we start to see some negative effects. So we're starting to see noise introduced in the model and it's starting to model effects that don't really exist in reality. Um, so we can still see what's going on basically as clearly as we could at three kilometers, um, but the noise is starting to become a dominant factor. And if we continue to increase the detail without man managing that noise correctly, um, we can get some really negative effects. So you can sometimes see this on SkySight. Um, as grid scale noise. So we see within this area of thermals, I think we're looking at the thermal height charts or thermal strength charts somewhere um, up in northern New South Wales. And we see this grid pattern, which is actually the grid of the model coming through. And it started to resolve thermals explicitly. So it's actually modeling the full development of thermals from the ground and how they bloop away. And you can see it thinks there's one thermal on this grid point, then not this grid point, and then another one on this grid point, which is, is just not how thermals form in reality. Uh, they don't form in this grid structure. So the grid itself has become the dominant weather effect. So that's something we try and manage out of the model um, by good configuration of the model. Um, so we've talked about the negatives of resolution and let's talk about the positives and what it actually achieves, particularly for the area you guys fly. Um, so one example I like to use is we've got the Australian Alps, we've got Vanilla. And as you're probably familiar, almost every day, there's strong convection in land. It triggers a very strong sea breeze, which sucks the cold, moist air in from the ocean. It filters through the Alps and reaches Benalla. Uh, and usually it ruins the soaring by mid-afternoon or late afternoon. And if you're not on final glide, you're going to be in trouble when you get back to Benalla. Um, and the places it filters through are things like the Nilakuti Gap. So I think you're familiar with it, but it's a relatively wide passage through the mountains there that a lot of the air pours through. Of course, it actually pours through the smaller ones as well, but the bigger ones do the majority of the heavy lifting. Um, so a lot of weather models won't be detailed enough to actually resolve these gaps. So if we, I've just entirely fabricated these numbers, but let's say we had a, a let's say it's 12 kilometers across the Nelicuta gap from peak to peak. And in reality, the wind just blows through. So we're looking at the vertical cross-section here and a horizontal cross-section here, the wind just blowing straight through that gap, the sea breeze coming through. 
so if we only had a 12 kilometer weather model and those forecast points happen to drop on the top of this hill and the top of that hill, as far as the weather model is aware, there's no passage for the wind through those hills there. So the wind has to go around the hills or potentially it's impassable as far as the weather model is concerned. Um, so as far as it can tell, the sea breeze will never come through and it'll say there's going to be great flying at Benella until the end of the day because there's never going to be that flush of cold, stable air coming through. Whereas if we had, say, a model at three kilometers, it actually could put a point at every peak all the way down to the valley and then back up again. The model can now understand that wind can actually blow through that valley and that's going to have a huge impact on the storing of vanilla. Sea breeze will come through and ruin the flying. Um, so it's really important to have appropriate resolution for the topography you're trying to resolve so you can capture these kinds of effects um, without succumbing to the grid scale noise we talked about previously. Um, another problem with the increase in resolution though is presentational problems. So when you do start to resolve those peaks and troughs on the mountains and um, you start to understand that the thermals are actually often the mountains only coming from the peaks and not from the valleys and that creates for example this area here so it's actually a nice flying day um, but the weather model can see that it's no good in these valleys here uh, this is somewhere in the Italian Alps I think um, and it's, it might look at first glance that it's not a very good soaring day because you see all these areas of blue and it's actually only these small lines on top of the mountains here where the thermal conditions are good um, so it really creates presentational problems for us to present higher resolution data. Um, and that's the thing we've been spending a lot of time and effort on to try and make that um, easier for pilots to understand. You can see the same effect with cumulus. So when you get enough detail, you actually understand that the cumulus only forms on the peaks and not on the valleys. And then you have this challenge to present. So pilots will look at this and think, okay, there's not very much cumulus around, but in actual fact, this is a really nice day in the Alps. You've got strong cumulus coming from the peaks and not coming from the valleys. And the same challenge is present with PFD. So potential flight distance is a chart on the full version of SkySight. It gives you an estimate of how far you can fly each day. And of course, within most of the Alps, where you can't fly in the valleys, like these valleys here, or particularly these valleys here at all, uh, there's just no thermals there through day or night. But they're only coming off the peaks here. So it looks on first glance like this is not a very good flying day. Um, but in actual fact, on the areas you would fly, it is very nice. So it's a really difficult problem for us to solve on presenting this um, more detailed information well. Um, so going back to that forecast area size question, um, I just collated some significant upstream effect examples. So this is 250 kilometers off the west coast of Mexico. You can see there's a Guadalupe Island here and you can see how significant these downstream effects are. So we've got the wind splitting around Guadalupe Island and then I think we get um, a von Kármán vortex you see this little water sea forming here spiraling and this zigzag pattern going all the way uh, off towards Mexico. And possibly these gravity waves are influenced by Guadalupe Island, maybe not, um, very hard to say. Um, but you can see that a, uh, a less detailed model would be unable to resolve these effects and the impact they're gonna have hundreds of kilometers downstream. So it's very important to forecast for that largest area possible. Uh, these kinds of effects, perhaps on a smaller basis, will be happening off um, things happening in North and South Australia, like the Flinders, um, or off uh, the uh, Great Dividing Range out to the Northeast. Um, so the effects can ha happen a very long way away. So here's another example. This is again, hundreds or thousands of kilometers downwind of these islands. You can see tiny little islands, just single volcanoes, and these massive downstream effects. So it's very important to have that largest forecast area possible. And that's what we try and do with SkySight, trying to do basically the whole of Eastern Australia in one extremely high definition weather model. Um, I can't explain why these von Kármán vortices zigzag back and forth and then go 90 degrees left. But again, this is the kind of phenomenon you can only resolve with a very detailed weather model. Um, and you're not gonna get the benefit of that unless you're forecasting for a very large area. And of course, wave is very significant as well. Um, so you can get wave from both the Great Dividing Range, from the Australian Alps, from the Flinders Ranges, and that's gonna have downstream effects hundreds, not thousands of kilometers away. So now we've talked about what the models that are out there are. Um, so now we've talked about how you evaluate weather models. Let's talk about the weather models that are actually out there. So GFS is the one most people are familiar with. Uh, GFS is a global weather model run by the United States. Uh, if you're looking at XC Skies, for example, it's showing you the GFS model. 
Um, it's quite a low resolution model. It won't resolve any of those complex effects from hills and mountains. The forecast points are something like uh, 18 kilometers apart. Um, the accuracy is reasonably good. Um, there's better global models, but um, the key thing is GFS is freely available. Uh, there's a bunch of European models that are global, like the ECMWF model and the Deutsche Wetterdienst ICON model. Um, they're a little bit higher resolution than the GFS. Uh, the ECMWF model in particular is um, generally regarded as better performing than the GFS, uh, particularly within Europe, uh, but they're very expensive to access and they don't provide all the data necessary to um, calculate soaring parameters. That's the ECMWF, the ICON actually does and we use that within Europe. Uh, and then there's WARF. So WARF is the name of the model that we run within SkySight. So it's a open source weather model. Um, or I, I say weather model, it's actually more of a framework or a toolkit within which you can build your own weather model. Um, so it's very um, plug and play compatible. So you can write or utilize other people's parameterizations and then run it against a dynamical core. It's actually breaking down the world into that grid on your behalf. Uh, you typically run it from an initial state from GFS or ECMWF or ICON or somewhere like that. And it's very configurable. So we can run it at whatever resolution we like. We can run it wherever we like. We can run it over whatever area we like. And accuracy, in theoretically, can be excellent. Um, but it's very, it's very dependent on the configuration to how you set it up. Um, and basically, all regional weather models you see that aren't forecasting to the whole globe are running war for one of its sister or similar models. Um, so back to those models again. Uh, so GFS, I think I've written here, it's 25 kilometers globally. It's actually uh, spaced in degrees rather than kilometers. So it's a bit variable. Uh, ECMWF is about nine kilometers globally. Deutsche Wetterdienst is 13 kilometers. Within Europe, it's six kilometers. So sky site, we vary it. I think around, for most of Australia, around three kilometers. Um, HRRR is a model in the United States, about three kilometers. And RASPs are somewhere between 36 kilometers and two kilometers, depending on whoever set them up. <coughs> so now we're getting onto the cell as to um, why we've, um, or how I think we've met those criteria and we set out for evaluating those models within SkySight. Um, so the key difference, excuse me, the key differentiating factor behind SkySight between many other weather models is our use of cloud computing. So instead of sticking servers at a physical rack somewhere or just renting one server and running our forecasts on there, that's a very expensive way to approach things. You have to buy right, you have a lot of capital. You have to pay for these servers upkeep. Um, when it's time to upgrade them, you have to buy new ones. When you have a short-term project, you have to buy the servers for the project and sell them afterwards or switch them off and sit them in a rack and waste money. Um, the new way to do things is to do it with cloud computing. So with cloud computing, I pay by the second for the servers I rent and I can rent arbitrary sized servers as big or small as is needed to run a forecast and then turn them off at the end of the forecast. So I don't even need to pay for them for a full day. I can pay for them for three hours to turn them on, do all the forecasts and then turn them off again. <coughs> and uh, I can position those anywhere in the world as needed for that source data. So for initial state, a lot of the sources we use um, they're coming off FTP servers somewhere in Japan or somewhere terribly slow and difficult to get data from. Or when they're published, they're very heavily contended. And I want to get that data before other people and get the model running rather than wait for it to download. So we're able to position those servers in the best location to actually start that weather model. And that lets us get a head start on getting the best data available and getting that data out as soon as possible. Um, because we have essentially unlimited compute power on the cloud, I can run extremely complex parameterizations um, that just wouldn't be possible with off-the-shelf servers. And when new servers come out every six months or something like that, I can just upgrade to the latest hardware and immediately have it going. Um, another thing is that it's, uh, it makes it uh, much easier to evaluate uh, whether one configuration of the weather model, one set of parameterizations is better than another set because I can just spin up another 100 servers and forecast over the last 10 days whether it was better if I did a forecast this way or that way and then compare it on the fly. Whereas if I had one rack of servers during one day's forecasts, um, then I'd need to buy a second rack to do these tests in parallel and then they'd just be sitting there doing nothing, wasting money um, during the time when I wasn't doing those tests. And the same applies for resolution. So because of that extremely high compute capacity and extremely low cost, uh, we're able to do 
very large areas in very high detail, both vertically and horizontally, um, for a relatively reasonable cost. Um, so despite everything I've told you about why it's important to have a good weather model, I actually believe that the weather model itself is not the area where we're losing the most information trying to get it from um, the computer to the mind of the user. Most of the loss of information, I think, is happening in the interface itself. So I've tried to build within SkySight a really interactive, beautiful, usable, ergonomic user interface um, that lets the computer tell you what the weather's going to be with as little loss possible. So there's um, you're presenting the data in a way that hopefully everyone can understand as easily as possible and there's no confusion about uh, what the computer thinks it's going to be and what you think it's going to be after you've read it. Um, so I do that by, I'm sure you're familiar with this, uh, we overlay everything on top of a map you're already used to, so everything's on top of Google Maps or a similar web Mercator projection. So if you know how to find your house on a map, you know how to find where your gliding club is on SkySight. Um, we include the other important topography within gliding, which is the airspace. So we've got the airspace for all of Australia loaded onto SkySight as well, and for and the whole world, in fact. Um, so you can actually plan your flights in relation to the airspace. Um, it's all very good and well to have the weather forecast on your laptop, but um, when you're sitting on the grid waiting to launch and you still haven't checked the weather, there's no reason you can't do it on your phone in the cockpit. You can do it in the car on the way to the gliding club with your iPad. Um, the forecast is no good if you don't have a device with you that can read it. So um, by making it possible to read the forecast on as many devices as possible and trying to give you all of the functionality on all those devices, I think it's really important to be able to get that data actually to the users. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the ways we express that data. So we try and slice and dice it in a number of different ways. So the point and uh, or table forecast, uh, you get this one for free, I think, on GFA Met. So we present for any given location. You just move this little dot around draws these nice charts, the weather through the day for you. So we can see the hydrothermals coming up here, the condensation layer way up there. So there's not much in the way of cloud today. You can see the temperatures and the pressure. Uh, the route forecast, so we can have a route. So we draw point, point, point. This one's only on the full version of SkySight. And you can see along that route, the hydrothermals, the absolute top of thermal is higher than you'll be able to climb and the condensation layer up there and a little bit of gray area there for the cloud. And you can see it automatically optimizes what it thinks the optimal route around this task for us is. And it has a little start time calculator here that tells you how fast you're going to go at different times of day. Now the skew T forecast. Um, I don't think you get this one on GFA Met either. I'm not sure. Um, so for any given location, we can just move this little dot around and we get a skew T right away in real time. Um, it is, of course, a calculated skew T, not an observed skew T, um, but you see how we present it. So we've got the dew point here, the temperature here. We've got the virtual lifted parcel here. So that's a path of a parcel of air that starts just half a degree warmer than uh, the surface temperature down here and where that's going to go. So we can see there's not a strong inversion here. In fact, there's no inversion. So there's nothing that limits the path of that parcel. And we have the wind here. So we can see zero wind at the surface, quite quickly picking up to about 15 knots. Uh, the wind gram, so this was uh, a request from paraglider pilots, they really like this chart. So it's kind of like a skew T, but it's for every hour of the day. So it's showing us here the relative humidity in a vertical profile from the surface up to about 20,000 feet. And we can see as it changes hour by hour what the moisture is doing. So I think in this case we had a front going through late in the afternoon, about four o'clock, you see this mass of moisture coming through. And what was previously a nice dry atmosphere is now much more moist through the afternoon. Interestingly, you can also see that surface inversion, I think. <coughs> so maybe some fog or some very low cloud or stratus early in the morning, clearing about 12 o'clock. And then in the afternoon, it's just total dense moisture down on the surface. So probably cloud cover again. Uh, we have integration with satellite providers. So the Himawari satellite, for example, in Australia we have. So you can see the current sat photo before you go flying. You can see if the forecast is looking like it's going to be right or not. And the rain radar is integrated with that as well now. Um, we have our wave forecasts. Uh, so we developed these for the Perlan project, which you might have heard of. It's a project to fly a glider to 90,000 feet. Um, so you can see here a little map of the waves. So the red lines where it's going up, the blue lines where it's going down. And you can actually draw a cross section across that wave and then see the shape and structure of that. So we can see a primary, a secondary, 
tertiary quaternary. And in this case, we can see they're going all the way up past 36,000 feet. And we tested this with the Perland project and we found even when they're up at 75,000 feet, the wave was within 500 meters of where it was predicted to be. So we're pretty happy with the accuracy on that. Um, there's one pilot, uh, Dennis Tito in the United States, who won the OLC for a couple of years in a row. He's got a Arcus jet and he's been flying at night with night vision goggles, military grade night vision goggles. And he's got the sky side forecast on his iPad and they just follow the red line flying the blue wave in the middle of the night. Um, just using those night vision goggles to avoid hitting terrain. Um, we talked about how it's important to have the weather on all of your devices. And of course, we're not just limited to having it on your mobile phone, your laptop and your tablet, but also if you have CU and you like using CU for planning your tasks, you can have the sky site weather integrated with that. So here we can see the wave in the Pyrenees on CU. Uh, if you have an UDI, you can have the forecast loaded onto your device. Uh, so you just need the Nava to update app, a SkySet subscription, a CU subscription, and an UDI. And then we can see here the wave. So you see the red area of lift. You can also have the convergence or the XC speed. Now uh, the XC speed chart, we try and consider all of the factors for you, convergences, strong thermals, uh, good cloud bases, and we just give you a general chart of where is fast to fly right now. Uh, if you have an LX9000, uh, that's one of those big screens you see in some people's panels. Uh, you can have the forecast on there as well. So we've got the height of thermals here or the overdevelopment, and you can use that uh, in flight for planning where you're going to go next or avoiding weather. You get the satellite pictures from SkySight as well on your LX9000. Uh, so they're going to update in flight, and you can actually see the thunderstorms growing up back home. Um, and we're also integrating with a number of other devices. Um, there's an integration for XCSaw now. Um, I don't support that, but it's on the XCSaw forums, and I believe it does work. And there's a excuse me. And there's a number of other manufacturers that we're talking with about integrating with them as well. <coughs> so let's talk about what's coming next. Um, so. Uh, so what's recently new? Uh, so what's new? Uh, we recently added the IGC upload on SkySight. So now you can upload an IGC trace and see how it compares to the forecast. So this was a wave flight I did uh, from the French Alps to the Pyrenees and back a couple of months ago. And you can see how well it matches the wave systems here. And when we got over to the Pyrenees and then back again. Of course, it's showing you a forecast, a route for the whole day only on, on a chart for half an hour. So on a very long, like this was a nine hour flight, it doesn't match over here, because I've got the chart for while we were over here loaded. Um, this actually colors the chart now on the latest version of SkySight, or it colors the route rather by uh, your vertical velocity, whether you're going up and down or by your altitude, so you can compare it in even more detail. Uh, we've recently added whoops, the 3D wave forecast, so you can actually look at the wave shapes in three dimensions and pan and zoom and uh, move around those completely. Uh, we have SkySight offline. So if you don't have one of those fancy devices, if you follow these steps to add SkySight to your home screen, you just click on the little three dots and then go add to home screen. When you next open SkySight, you'll have these little download icons and they let you download the forecast before you fly. And then when you switch your phone into airplane mode, you'll still be able to open up SkySight and access these charts that you've downloaded in flight. And you can see it even has a little dot for your GPS position to show you where you are in relation to those charts. Uh, for iPhones, it's a similar process. You click on, I don't know what this button is supposed to be, the share button, I guess, and then add to home screen. Um, another thing we're working very hard on is operational verification of our forecasts. So we want to make sure our forecasts are good and they keep getting better. <coughs> so we have a number of dashboard tools like this that show us, um, in this case, the little dots represent forecast errors. So you can see larger dots are bigger errors. And I've got two different operational models for Europe running side by side, and I'm comparing the error for those models against each other, trying to decide what the next upgrade for the model in Europe is gonna be. And we're running the same kinds of things for Australia as well. And the real in innovative thing I think we're working on is uh, connecting that to the OGN as well to get some validation of how strong thermals are and how high thermals are. Because otherwise, there's um, no information actually available about whether whether models are getting the height of thermals correct or the cloud base is correct. 
or a string term was correct. Um, one of the very cool new features we worked on is the root suggester. So when you plan a task, it draws this black line um, that shows you the optimal route, but you can also ask it to suggest your own entire task. Um, so we can click on root forecast and then we want a medium triangle task, put one dot and ask it to generate and it'll produce what it thinks is the best triangle task for us to fly. And it'll even consider factors like airspace in that. And you can see it also has consideration for the different times of day. So we can say we want to start at 12 and we'll do 130, it tells us we'll do 134 kph. And you can see how it's actually routing us around <coughs> um, the weather. So we see this is the XC speed chart showing where it thinks it's fast to fly. So it thinks we want to go here then come around here. And you can see on the way back, it wants to go around this way. And then right late in the day, we have to deviate way over here to get home again. So I think it thinks there's a convergence line coming through from southeast to our northwest there. Uh, we're connected with competitions now. So if your competition puts its task on soaring spot, you'll see a little drop down here, which shows you competition tasks. And you just click your task in your class and it'll be loaded right on top of SkySide as soon as the organizers publish the task each day, which really helps for um, planning your flights. And what's coming next? So we talked a little bit about that uh, ongoing verification. Um, another extension to the weather modeling we're looking at is an ensemble modeling. So this is um, when you see a weather forecast that says there's like a 60% chance of rain. Um, the way they do that is by ensemble modeling. So within SkySight, we have one set of input data and we run one forecast and that's it. That's the forecast you get. Um, but there's often a range of uncertainty with the data available. So maybe Let's say hypothetically we had a temperature sensor that said it was 25 degrees, but we knew this temperature sensor was often off by half a degree up or down. So the idea would be let's run 10 models in parallel and let's run one model assuming it's going to be 24 and a half, one model 24.6, 24.7, all the way through the range of possibilities. Um, and doing this across not just the one sensor, of course, but all of the sensors going into the weather model. And from all of these models running in parallel, we can actually then give you some statistics about the forecast. So because we've got 10 forecasts now with slightly different input data, if one of them says it's going to rain and nine of them don't, it's probably not gonna rain. And that's how a weather service is able to give you a 10% chance of rain. Um, we can say, how likely is something gonna happen? So is it possible it's gonna exceed 25 degrees? Is it possible the thermals will never start? Uh, we can say what the most likely value is with more certainty than we could with the deterministic forecast. So if we were running just that one model and just that one model said it was going to rain, but all of the other models said it wasn't going to rain, um, that wouldn't be a great forecast because um, it probably is going to rain. Uh, whereas if we ran all of them, we could give you the average, which would be it is most likely, in fact, going to rain. And we can also predict extreme circumstances. So if um, there was a one in 10 chance of, 150 kilometer an hour winds coming through the airfield in the afternoon, maybe you wouldn't go flying. But if you're running a deterministic model or even a not small number of models, uh, you wouldn't be able to see that unlikely but possible extreme event occurring. Um, so this is an example of, you can see uh, three diff uh, two different models here, NCEP, which is the GFS model, ECMWF, which is European model, and you can see these lines in gray, which are ensemble models associated with those. So you can see initially they all agreed quite closely, but then more than a couple of days out, you see the ensembles. So these are different, starting with different data in that set start to vary grossly. So here we've got the temperature and we can see at the end of a week, uh, there's disagreement between the models of more than 20 degrees. Um, so that initial input conditions turned out to be quite important for what's gonna happen later in the week. Um, so that's what I had for the talk today. I hope you've learned a bit about weather modeling, a bit about some of the features on SkySight and why we do things the way we do. Um, a little bit about what's coming. Um, I hope you'll consider subscribing to SkySight if you don't already. And I hope you're enjoying GFA Met if you're a GFA member. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm all ears. Well, from me, Matthew, thank you very much. That was uh, really enlightening around the depth of uh, data resolution and accuracy, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you.
uh, Roger Drew Matt. Some of the modelling that you're producing, the results are showing convergence as ribbons across uh, the landscape. Are people validating those convergence lines? I'm not talking about the obvious one is CB is trying, well, that's going to happen, but you're showing finer scale convergence. Um, and it's really interesting if uh, people are, are, are using your model and using information to generate uh, uh, improved cross country speeds because convergence uh, is so good. So it depends on the areas you're talking about. Um, so for example, uh, let me just turn on my screen sharing again. So certainly when you see sea breeze convergences, like I think we can see a sea breeze convergence along the coastline here, that is a convergence that is gonna happen and is there. But uh, the challenge with convergence modeling is because a lot of these effects are very small and very weak, we really have to turn up the gain on um, this chart. So we're looking at a very small scale here, like it's only a range of half a knot to one and a half knots. So you start to get lots of effects that are not in fact convergences and are just model noise. So we can see out here, way out on the coast, um, this stuff is not useful. This is probably just isolated queue or thunderstorms or something like that forming and it's just forming noise in the model. Um, so we can see across a, well, so you can see here, this is probably a real sea breeze convergence. You can see this effect all the way along the coastline and certainly all along South Australia here along the coast. This is a real convergence that would exist, but often I'm trying to find a better example. Yeah, when you see, for example, this kind of information here, the I wonder if this is the ribbons you're talking about. So this is wind hook in Namibia. This is just crap. This is um, uh, thunderstorms forming and decaying and showing up as these little blobs everywhere, um, which is not useful information. So it is important to try and distinguish uh, the information it's giving you as to whether it's a real phenomenon or whether it's just model noise. Um, but certainly, um, if you study the forecast before you fly and you can see those convergence lines moving through. So this looks like it's a real convergence line triggered by the coast here. They are absolutely useful and I'm certainly using them in my flights. Um, I did lots of uh, 1000k flights out of Bathurst when I was flying from there, utilizing that convergence that comes through quite reliably along the Great Dividing Range here. Um, yeah, there's certainly value to be derived. But uh, if you're say thermal soaring out of narrow mine on a hot and stable day and you see these little blips here up and down, that's not useful information. Thank you. Any other questions sir, for Matt? Yes, uh, from Murray Stimson. Go okay, Murray. Murray, go ahead. Um, uh, I'm very interested in the OGN verification um, and the many issues that that would present because um, there's a great many variables in the height and the rate of climb that people achieve compared to what is available from the atmosphere. Um, yeah, was and the way we cope for that is um, by virtue of more data. So we only trust um, data that is validated by multiple gliders. So if um, five gliders fly through an area, we take the highest height achieved by one of those as the top of the boundary layer. Uh, rather than say the average or something like that and the strongest or the average strength thermal as the thermal strength through that area. Okay, and um, uh, I guess one of the uh, things that I'd like to understand is what are the criteria for the various stipple gradients, uh, stipple colorings on the presentations? Uh, so the only chart that has stipples uh, is the thermal strength chart. And we have, so here we're looking at uh, Northwestern Victoria, you see here is clear. So the thermals are not broken, they're strong normal thermals. <coughs> well, maybe not strong, but not broken by the wind. And the first layer of stippling here is these small dots indicating moder moderately or lightly broken thermals. And then the large dots out here and across most of Victoria today are heavily broken thermals. How it's literally calculated is the areas that are clear are a buoyancy shear ratio of um, greater than 10, I think. So the thermal strength needs to be at least, maybe it's closer to eight or something. The thermal strength needs to be 
eight times stronger than the wind. And then the lightly stippled area is something like the thermals need to be three times stronger than the wind. And then the heavily stippled area is there's not that much difference between the strength of the wind and the strength of the thermals, which suggests that the thermal is going to be very broken because they're going sideways, not up. Thank you. Um, Matthew, it's Mike Duran. Um, obviously, this season we've had a big impact from the bushfires. And I think you said that one of the issues that you've had is that none of the models really take that into account. Do you think, I mean, do you see any way of dealing with that? Or is that sort of almost impossible to, to deal with? Uh, yeah, I don't have a solution to that from my end. There's no data available that I can utilize uh, and there's no research really or very limited research done in the area. Um, there's kind of experimental models in this area, but none of them have been formally validated. Um, it's definitely a problem, but it's well outside of the scope of problems I'm, I'm able to tackle, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do see a question there from Hamid. Um, so I run today's model. I try and have out by 8 a.m. every day. Tomorrow's model I try and have out by 5 p.m. And then models further in the future than that. So for the day after tomorrow and so on, they're on a, a irregular cycle. So there's no fixed time of day they come out. Um, but it's roughly every 18 hours they update. And the model run for Australia takes, I think, about two and a half, three hours to run. Um, I'm not convinced of the value of more frequent ones than that. Uh, at the end of the day, the cost of business. Um, so if I double the number of runs, it literally just doubles my costs right away. Uh, and that would be the parameterizations or the resolution or something like that um, in order to give you more frequent updates. I think that would be a net negative than trying to target just the times that are most important to check. So most people plan their flights the night before and the day of, so they're the two times they try and target. We do sometimes update in the afternoon as well when there's events on or competitions or world championships or things like that. Oh, probably just uh, one question from me, Matt. Um, how, how are you domestically at the moment? I know you're in Germany at the moment trying to get to the UK, so thank you very much for... Uh, getting up early on Easter Sunday and, uh, and talking to a bunch of guys the other side of the planet. Um, but uh, how, how do you get your gliding aspirations and your, uh, your business um, at, the, at the same time? And where are you going to be over the next 12 months? Uh, so it's actually the other way around. I'm in the UK trying to get to Germany at the moment. So my partner's in Germany and I'm in the UK. Um, I won't bore you with the details of how that happened, but uh, I was meant, I'm meant to be in Germany now. Um, as for my plans for the next 12 months, um, that's a little bit out of my hands at the moment. Uh, the plan was to fly both world championships this year and then uh, come back probably to Melbourne, actually. Um, my partner and I are looking at um, working in Melbourne for the next few years. Uh, so I might be seeing a lot more of you guys. Very good. Well, Geelong Gliding Club would love to, uh, love to buy you a beer for... Uh, a fantastic presentation. That was quite extraordinary. I'd, uh, you know, we, we, we lazily fiddle, fiddle through our, uh, our UI and look at it and think, oh, that's, that's pretty cool and that's pretty nice. And I was just demonstrating it to somebody tonight uh, before the session. Uh, but, but to really understand the extraordinary back end uh, that, that you and your team have built is, is, is just phenomenal. And I'm, I'm, I'm deeply impressed and, uh, um, and very thankful on behalf of the group that you were able to uh, make the time to uh, uh, to tell us uh, what you're up to and how you do it and uh, where it's all going. Much appreciated. Okay, glad you liked it. Um, unless there's any more questions, I'll leave you guys there and best wishes and maybe see you at the end of the year. Actually, Matt, I do have a question. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I really do want to subscribe, and this, this is a, a subscription question because I've, I've tried um, through SkySight on the internet to subscribe, and I've failed totally. Um, it, it, I, I don't know what the reason is, but um, it when I try to subscribe, it tells me I've already got one, 
or something, you know, I, and I, I just can't do it. I just, <laughs> and I've sent uh, um, email right. emails and, yeah. Uh, and, um, send me an email at matthew at skysite.io and I'll have a look at that for you. Oh, thank you, Matt. Appreciate that very much. All right. Yeah. All right, guys, I'll leave it there. Um, have a nice evening. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you. I finish again. Oh, well, guys, um, and uh, and girls, uh, I'm a <laughs> just just a little bit uh, bit awestruck by that presentation. I, I just didn't didn't quite expect that, but uh, um, let's just hope that uh, we can um, pull a few more rabbits uh, out of the hat uh, for uh, this uh, lockdown learning uh, program, as we're calling it. Um, I think uh, Mike tomorrow night will be. Uh, we're good, and he's he's about to say something. Yeah, just um, what I'm covering tomorrow is uh, FAI tasking, OLC tasking, and how you determine based on the weather forecast that you've received, and, and clearly some of the stuff we've seen with SkySight gives you a lot of information, but how do you then determine how fast you personally can go, what distance you can cover, and therefore what an appropriate task is, and how do you go about self-tasking or tasking for others. So um, look forward to seeing you if you're interested in that topic um, tomorrow. Yeah. Now, what, while I've got what is a fairly hefty cross-section of um, uh, Bacchus Marsh pilots, uh, we've got uh, topics coming up. Uh, a lot of them are, are around the, uh, the competencies in the uh, leading up to the GPC, uh, cross-country, navigation, that type of thing. Uh, and I've, I've asked uh, GGC members to, uh, through a survey, uh, what they would like to see as a, uh, as a priority. Um, so I would invite you, if you could, rather than just calling it out now where I've got no facility to note. But uh, my email address is jantardave at uh, gmail.com. Uh, it's fairly easy for a glider pilot to remember. Um, <clears throat> could, you, uh, could you please... Um, uh, just send some requests as to what you would like to uh, have cover. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to contact people like Matt Scudder or, you know, as subject matter expert as I can get along through with, with the network that I have and with Mike's and Armin's network to, uh, um, you know, bring some really interesting guys to uh, um, make some really interesting points. Um, if, you know, if we're going to have to live in isolation, we uh, we might as well go and uh, get some great information from the source. Uh, so Mike's going to start at 5 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, I believe the uh, uh, it's scheduled. So if you do get there at 4 o'clock, um, go and have a cup of tea and uh, come back at 5 o'clock. It'll be the same, um, uh, same meeting. So uh, I'll leave you to um, chair that one uh, tomorrow, Mike, if that's okay. Okay. Any other um, any other questions or thoughts? Um, we've got a, a few minutes before the published end of time, and uh, otherwise, um, just stick around for a, for a bit of a general chat and uh, abuse of those that you've been dearly missing over the last few weeks. Bye, everybody. I'm going to head. <laughs> See you. Bye. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. See ya. See ya. I'm going to head off as well. See you, everyone. <coughs> See you all. I'm off. Yep. Bye okay. bye. See you later, Everybody. people. Bye. Yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs> thanks, thanks for hosting this, Dave. I uh, really appreciated that. Yeah, it was, it was quite extraordinary, wasn't it? I. I I mean, as someone from the scientific community, you must be uh, uh, fairly impressed with the uh, the veracity and reliability of the, the work that they're doing. Yes, it is very impressive. Um, um, but as Matt said, it's the uh, it's the presentation that's equally important. And uh, you know, um, I I know that it's a uh, um, pretty much a silly question, but um, I can. I can see the use of this in um, 
automated flying, right? So basically, if you have a, a predicted uh, optimal track, right, through conditions, which is uh, basically on a half hour or, or less time basis, uh, basically, you, you have to be on autopilot to make the best use of it. You shouldn't deviate, as Dennis Tito was saying, you shouldn't deviate from what SkySide is telling you, even if the clouds look different. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to keep a look out there of the cockpit too. Oh, uh, well, I can figure out a, uh, a system to, to uh, relieve you of that burden as well, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you have any um, military grade night vision goggles, Murray? That sounded an interesting <laughs> prospect. We can do much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I Seriously, yeah. Um, That's a good choice. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's some pretty good stuff out there that would make uh, that a non-problem. Um, yeah, and you know, yeah. I've I've long uh, thought that this was a, a possibility to uh, win a world championships uh, using an automated glider. And the, the only problem is, who would actually want to fly in? It? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Yeah, uh, if, if, if and who would stand enough. on the podium as well? Yeah, that's right. The the, the software guy. <laughs> just just a quick comment from me here. Um, thanks everyone for the invite. Uh, being an outsider, it's a bit of a privilege. Um, thank you very much. Um, obviously, this technology is going to be a real challenge for guys of my age, etc. So um, let's give it our best shot and. Uh, make sure that our skills stay above the um, technology, eh? And that's our only chance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Look out the window.com. I agree with you. Yeah, well done. Well, um, that's the yeah, thing. Look, is the more... good, good to see some familiar faces there again, and I hope we'll catch up soon, so i better go and have some dinner. Thanks, guys. See you. Yeah, yeah. See you. Bye-bye. Well, the more technology you have, the easier it is, and the older you are, that you can fly. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Oh dear. Good night, people. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night, guys. <laughs> Good night. See ya. Good night. Uh, well, Thanks, are you Dave. trying to put us on pause here, Dave? <laughs> well said. Yeah, you're okay. Good night. You're pretty clever for a centre forward. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm looking forward to a hockey game as well. That'd be nice. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd even stick slap anyone. Yeah. All right. Good night, guys. See you, Dave. See you tomorrow.